And thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. So, as Lily said, my name's Gavin Francis. I'm a doctor and writer here locally, and it's my tremendous pleasure and privilege to talk to you just for the next few minutes about compassion and courage as they apply, as I see them applying, to the practice of medicine and of nursing, clinical practice. Now, I want to start out by telling you that I believe that clinical practice, the practice of medicine, the practice of nursing and the allied health professions are one of the most tremendously fortunate jobs to be in. And they're fortunate, they're tremendously fortunate because I believe they give you a uniquely fascinating opportunity to meet all sorts of people that you wouldn't otherwise meet from all walks of life, perhaps even all over the world, and ease their suffering in a very direct, uncomplicated way. Now, the practice of medicine and of nursing, I would argue, are a kind of systematic approach to the easing of mental and physical suffering. Now, whenever we talk about concepts, ideas, I always think it's useful to think about the words we use for those ideas and look at where those words come from. And often it can cast light onto what we really mean by what we, when we use them. So compassion is an old Latin word. It means together suffering or fellow feeling. And it refers to that imaginative act of empathy, of putting yourself in someone else's shoes and thinking for a moment how it would be to be them, to perhaps suffer as they are at that moment. Courage is another old Latin word. It comes from a root which essentially means with heart. It's come to mean bravery over time, but its origin is in an emotional engagement, meaning with heart. And we still carry the remnants of that meaning in our word encourage, for example, when we try and encourage others to engage emotionally with a difficult task ahead of them. Now, there's a paradox at the heart of clinical practice, I would argue. And that paradox is that I think in order to be an effective clinician, it's essential to have compassion for those you meet. You need to imaginatively enter their suffering feel how it would be to be that individual, often with people who are suffering degrees of physical or mental pain that you have never experienced, degrees far beyond what you have ever experienced. And although many clinicians would love to be able to spend enormous amounts of time with their patients to understand exactly what it is they're going through, the pressures of the work environment that they're under meaning that's often impossible. So, for example, when I used to work in emergency medicine in the Royal Infirmary, I might be seeing 20, 25 patients a day, a shift. When I work in general practice here in the south side of this city, sometimes I see 40. So, if you imaginatively enter the suffering of 40 people every day, and then you go home and you imaginatively enter the suffering of 40 more people the next day, and you do that again and again, you're going to burn out. You're going to suffer what's called compassion fatigue for good reason. But the converse is just as unappealing. If your clinician doesn't imagine your suffering, doesn't emotionally engage with your suffering, they're unlikely to do their best to help you to ease it. And I've seen this particularly in uh, emergency department environments, but also in primary care, pressured primary care clinics where people who are too emotionally engaged or too thin-skinned, or perhaps even we might argue feel too much compassion, work very well for a while, but they burn out and uh, they see less patients. But the converse, as I said, is just as unappealing. And what I'm particularly concerned about is situations which increasingly arise, particularly in certain political contexts, where we start to ask or we're asked to judge who is more deserving of sympathy than others? Now, sometimes there's pressure, and sometimes it happens on its own, that somebody is perceived to have brought their suffering on themselves. Now, I saw this repeatedly in emergency departments where sometimes I would stitch up the wrists of people who slashed open their own wrists week after week after week. And there was a tendency in that situation perhaps to feel less sympathy 
And I've seen people be treated with this empathy in that circumstance. Similarly, if you admit a patient with the problems of alcohol overdose, alcohol intoxication, week after week after week, some people might end up treating that individual with less sympathy, compassion, or empathy. But I want to argue it's far too complicated to do that, and that would be an expression of lazy thinking. Um, I've met many people who cut open their own wrists not through any wish to burden the health services or to turn up in emergency departments on a Saturday night, but because that is the only way they've found to give vent to extreme personal anguish. Similarly, I've met many alcoholics for whom alcohol is quite clearly a substitute for love. And then if we were going to start judging who's deserving of compassion, where would we stop? Do we stop with, for example, somebody who broke their own tibia on a skiing holiday? Well, they brought it on themselves. Or the overworked banking executive suffering palpitations through the stress of their own life. Now, our idea of compassion in the West comes really, uh, a lot of it is left over from a medieval Christian tradition where compassion was a virtue, one of the seven cardinal virtues, often opposed to the deadly sin of envy or jealousy. It was considered something saintly, something to be aspired towards, an, an extreme which you should work towards in all your life. But there are other traditions, of course. The ancient Greeks, as a virtue tradition, they didn't include compassion at all. Their virtues were justice, courage, temperance. And that's what they emphasized. The Greeks also had a very different virtue philosophy than the medieval Christian one. They believed that all virtue should be a balance between extremes. And so they would argue that you can have too much compassion just as you can have too little. Um, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, don't measure, mention compassion at all. It's not there. They just prefer piety, fidelity. Um, but moving east, Buddhism, of course, three out of the four divine states of mind venerated by Buddhism refer to aspects of compassion. And Hinduism has always revered compassion. In fact, they had a distinction. They have two words for compassion, depending on the compassion you feel for somebody who may have brought their suffering on themselves versus the compassion you feel for someone who is entirely blameless for their pain. Now, East or West, Buddhist or Christian, if you look at the iconography, saints are traditionally um, depicted with halos coming out of their heads. It doesn't matter where you are on Eurasia. And now that we have functional MRI scanners and various types of imaging, we know that if you put somebody into an MRI, a functional scanner, and you show them images of someone in pain, you find out some truly remarkable things. First of all, a viewer watching someone suffering, their brain behaves in part, on a modest way, as if they were suffering themselves. So they recreate the image they're seeing within a part of their brain, a part called the insula, which is just above and deep in from your ears. Something else truly remarkable has been discovered in these studies, and that there's a neurobiological basis to the distinction emphasized in Hinduism. If you put someone in one of these scanners and they watch someone suffering who they believe to have brought the suffering on themselves, they feel less compassion or they, you see less of these compassionate uh, changes on the scanner. Similarly, if somebody who is suffering belongs to a different social group than the viewer, they feel less compassion. So what I would like to argue Finishing off as thinking points to moving forward, first of all, we must be on our guard when people that we see who are suffering belong to different social groups than ourselves. That's very clear because there's a natural human tendency to diminish your compassionate feelings in that situation. Secondly, that um, we have to be careful if we think people have brought their own suffering on themselves. Different social group, or have brought their suffering on themselves, we have a tendency to think that they are less deserving of our compassion. And finally, I would just like to propose the idea, just for reflection, that sometimes the old medieval tradition of virtue that we've inherited may be less helpful than the Greek tradition, where we view compassion not just as something for saints, 
something that only some of us could ever aspire to, but something for everybody, something that we could all reach when we have managed to find the balance between these extremes. We live in a world saturated with images of suffering, and I've been talking about doctors and nurses, but these issues apply to all of us. We all need to be on our guard when people are suffering that belong to different groups than ourselves. And we all need to be very careful when we assume that they've brought it on themselves. Because our compassion, our um, humanity, and our uh, ability to function in the world really do depend on it. Thanks very much.